So Chris, tell us a bit about, you know, you were there from the start. How did the paint service come about? Yeah, um, the paint service came about uh, in about 2004. And it was because the local paint service, the, the hospital trust, um, again, they were uh, they were kind of overwhelmed with, with, uh, with people needing to be referred in. And um, they, uh, they were struggling, I suppose, was the reality. And, and the CCG, the Clinical Commissioning Group, they got involved and um, they said, well, you know, we're happy to support a pain service, but we want to look at doing things slightly differently because the evidence base was starting to change around that time from um, interventions in pain to um, more of a kind of a, I guess, a sustainable way of, of managing pain. Perhaps people would say non-interventional way uh, of managing pain. You know, just it was becoming apparent that there are other ways of managing pain. And so I think the CCG uh, wanted uh, us to start exploring that. And I'd already been involved in a in setting up a pain service in Liverpool um, a year or two earlier. So I got involved then. And um, so we, we planned it and we um, we implemented it. And it was really small at the start. It was me and, and, uh, and a physiotherapist and just offering um, one or two clinics a week. And I think at that time we probably had about, um, I don't know, five or six people referred in a week and it just grew really and um so so yeah that was that was kind of the start of it and um we i think we collaborated a bit with the the acute trust who run the pain service there and again it was kind of obvious that that you know we'd we'd wanted to do things differently I mean, my my pain training was um specifically um well originally it was it was quite interventional but um i'd done a pain fellowship which um was was for a year um, and that really was focused. I was able to define my own kind of pain training at that time. And um, so with the, um, the, the the mentor and with the Walton Centre who was doing it with, they said, fine, you know, you do what you want to do. And so I focused a lot more on community stuff. Mm. And um, so it wasn't so much intervention, but a lot more about rehabilitation and, and diagnostics. And um, so it, um, it started that way, really. And the physio that we had, uh, she was keen and she wanted to kind of be involved in and helping people rehabilitate so and, and why why develop into the multidisciplinary team we have now why, why do that with pain i think it was i mean it was apparent that we uh well we know you know pain is such a multifactorial thing and um we we recognized at the time it was kind of a foot in the door really of, of getting pain services started we um we knew the physio and uh, medical uh, supporting the service was important, but we needed other disciplines as well. And psychology was was dead important, and um, occupational therapy, and you know, there's lots of different elements to a pain service. Um, but um, but yeah, we we started to look at putting a business case together for how we would develop into a multi professional team, mm. and that came about probably in about 2007. We were doing the business case, and then 2008 mm. we got it kind of agreed, and I think that was about the time that. <laughs> The, you came on. I started about 2008, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and what were your thoughts when you when you were kind of getting involved in a pain service that was like kind of so small and like <laughs> not really like kind of non-existent, really? Well, <clears throat> I was up for a challenge. Really, I hadn't. I was used to working with people with long-term health conditions, but at that point, wasn't particularly specialised in working with people with long-term pain. Mm. Um, and I remember when I was kind of first starting a meeting with you and you said, so Becky, what do you know about pain? And I said, not loads actually, but I know quite a lot about <coughs> working and having conversations with people whose lives have, have changed as a result of a health condition coming along. Did I say I didn't know loads about pain? <laughs> I can't remember actually. <laughs> um, you were in your GP practice at the time, okay. I think. Yeah. Um, and then I think we were talking about, you know, what, what different psychology might make and why did you want psychology mm. as part of the clinic? And, and I'm, I'm curious actually as to what you think about that. What, what difference has psychology made? I don't know. In... Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's really interesting to reflect on that because I think of, of my journey in pain and, and obviously with my background originally in anaesthetics and kind of an anaesthetic focus to pain, which, uh, which largely I think is, is you know, as an anaesthetist, you're kind of quite procedure-based. It's a practical specialty. Mm -hmm. um, but 
then going into general practice, you kind of see another side of, of communication and, and kind of long-term management of things. And um, the pain fellowship that I did, it was, um, as I said before, it was kind of much more focused on diagnostics and rehabilitation. But again, in, in the environment, it was, it was, you know, it was kind of a, a year-long fellowship uh, that the anaesthetists do. And again, it's quite interventionally focused. And I think I started off this clinic with a view that we can build um, perhaps interventions into rehabilitation a lot more than than we ended up doing mm -hmm. really and I think um, when we started working together it just it was like a bit of a light bulb moment for me it kind of made me realize there's a load more to it than um, you know than than focusing your medical um, input into into interventions and you know it kind of made me realize the power of really uh, learning and aspiring to good communication skills and how you can bring up the best in people. Uh, it stopped being about what I can do for, for people and it much more became an emphasis on helping people uncover what they do day to day for themselves and the skills that they have because that's going to help you know them at three in the morning when things are really bad. You know, I'm not going to help at three o'clock mm. in the morning when things are really bad. And, and uh, you know, the resilience that people have uh, on their own toolbox mm. is, you know, a vital ingredient. And so it really opened my eyes to that, I think, and, and the, the power of how we communicate. I think I thought as a GP that, you know, you get good uh, training in communication, but kind of you realise there's more levels to it than that. <laughs> and that really helped me, I think, having you. And, you know, you can uh, continue to learn in that way. Mm -hmm. And for me, it helps being embedded as a psychologist in a physical health team because I observe, uh, absorb and learn aspects of kind yeah. of pain physiology from you guys, from physios, etc. And, yeah. and that helps me in my practice when people are looking for better understandings of, of pain. You know, I work with colleagues and I can also reinforce those messages it's sometimes. So being embedded in a yeah. team, I think, is really helpful. It's funny, isn't it? Because like we talk about the biopsychosocial, um, we use this term biopsychosocial, don't we? And, and I think it, it reflects many levels, doesn't it? Because you've just hit upon, you know, how we operate biopsychosocially as a team, you know, and we bounce ideas off each other. And when we have our MDTs, you know, I, um, it's not like I would refer somebody uh, to you necessarily because you do the psychology bit. Mm -hmm. It's like we all mm -hmm. kind of have an understanding of our mm -hmm. of, of of each other's. Um, you know skills and, and so that rubs off on us really and yeah. so we we hopefully aspire to um, to operate biopsychosocially as clinicians and how we consult with people as well yeah yeah and I think we aim to look at the whole person yeah mm. so yeah biopsychosocial are all factors in that but within that we look at yeah the whole person and, and what they want and what's important mm. to them and that's definitely infiltrated in your practice as I've noticed over the years I think it has you know the um, you know, the different, uh, I suppose the different ways that you ask things, uh, that's been a big shift for me, is trying to ask things in a curious way and mm -hmm. genuinely having a curiosity about what works for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also um, a meeting of expertise in, in a consultation, because I think, you know, in medical school, and I suppose in a lot of other, you know, clinical specialties, you know, you kind of... Um, there's a lot of pressure on you to be the person who's got the answers. Mm. And um, a great, I suppose, a great lesson for me, which, you know, as I say, I continue to, to learn is, is, you know, you don't always have all the answers. Mm. And, you know, often people have better answers than you. Mm. And it's being open and receptive to that and not feeling mm. like you have to, you know, solve everything. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, you can sure you, you have an expertise in something, but people coming into that consultation, they have an expertise as well. And the greatest things happen when you, the two of those meet. Um, I think and that's been a real powerful thing for me that I've learned from you. So you've grown your curiosity in looking at what talents people already have and yeah, what they want definitely. more of, and that makes a difference in the practice of, of, of pain management, of living yeah. well with pain. In the yeah. Clinic. It stops being a, a transactional, I have this pain, um, somebody coming in, I have this pain, and then um, the clinician or doctor um, saying, well, okay, I can do this for that. Mm. Because, you know, automatically then, if you, because we we know how, um, you know, how multifactorial pain is and how unpredictable it is, those treatments might work. And so you're setting, 
you're setting up, you know, kind of disappointments all the time, really. And I think having something, a, a management plan in context where it's an agreed management plan and we're using all the skills that people have, there's different strands to their management plan. So if that doesn't necessarily work, or well, we've got a few other things that are on the go as well. Mm. And, um, you know, so it's 2% from that, 4% from that, and maybe they get a good benefit from something else, you know, medicines or interventions, but we're not holding all our hopes out on that. And, you know, it's it's much more about, you know, utilising everything you can, I think, and helping people, um, you know, kind of understand, I suppose, um, that, you know, interventions have a role to play or medicines may have a role to play, but it's not the, the only role. What would you say is the kind of focus or the ethos or the, the purpose, if you like, of the, of the service now? So if someone walked through the door, what, you know, what is the kind of aim, I guess, of the, of the service? I think um, for me, it's, it's, um, it's always about people being understood and, and being listened to. And if we fully listen to people, um, then it helps our understanding. And uh, when we understand people, then we collaborate better and we get a better result. You know, and, and um, I think the, um, the key to that is, is, is in, yeah, it, it, well, there's loads of keys. And I suppose it's, it's, um, it starts with how we greet people and you know how we um the first couple of seconds in a, a meeting that we have with people mm. um but it's for me it's all about listening mm. and uh, and being responsive um it's of course i guess my default as a doctor always is kind of I've got this kind of spinal reflex of diagnosis and and <laughs> you know what can i do what pill can i give i mean i kind of have to suppress that a little bit sometimes but it is we have to make sure the things fit together mm. and i think um, mm. my role i guess as a, as a doctor in the service is is making sure diagnostically it it seems right mm. and um, that there isn't risk associated mm. with you know with um, with diagnoses that perhaps haven't been uncovered. Mm. So, but the best will in the world, I think, people who've seen other clinicians, um, you know, pain's a complicated thing, isn't it? And um, sometimes, um, sometimes diagnoses are missed. You know, not often, but you know, we just got to be aware of that. Mm. Really, we have to have a foundation, and you know, there's a medical. That's why it's a biopsychosocial. There is a biological bit to it. You know, we have to be mindful of that, but um, it can't rule everything. That's the that thing for me. So people can expect a good listening to and understanding, and of course, the usual, if you like, medical stuff of diagnosis and treatments where possible, but also framed in this context of what this person wants and using the skills of the team to to help them get there and use use what their own resources to help themselves get there as well. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Definitely. It's that collaboration, I think, isn't it? Mm. I mean, from the psychology side of things, Becky, how do you feel, um, you know, people uh, people respond to you when you, mm. you know, when, when you see people in a pain service? How do they normally respond to kind of... Um, I, I think everybody's different. I think it depends on what they've kind of heard already mm. about, you know, what do psychologists do? I think I'm really careful about helping people have the message that seeing the psychologist doesn't mean the pain's all in your head because that can be a misconception sometimes which can be really hurtful you know well, why do I need to see a psychologist um, so I think yeah ev everybody's everybody's different and everybody wants something different from coming to see a psychologist which is basically about having conversations about trying to live as well as possible despite pain being around in people's <coughs> lives that's how I tend to kind of frame it, um, and then we take it from there. <laughs> I think the uh, thing oh, I've just choked on my coffee. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me. I think the thing about um, pain being in being in your head is a really, really important thing. It's something we, you know, I encounter a lot. Uh, <clears throat> you know, because people have heard different explanations of, of pain, and um, it's very easy to misinterpret. I think when somebody talks about pain and the uh, the way pain is modulated and the, the way pain's constructed, um, I think it's so easy to get into that pitfall of people walking away thinking that you're saying that this is this is in your head. Mm. And, um, at the end of the day, it's in your brain, isn't it? But mm. it's it's kind of it's a different connotation by someone understanding it's in your head. And, and perhaps we can talk <clears throat> more about that. Yeah. 